every single work in this show is relevant so um, to to a deeper understanding of the artist but there are these interesting moments so 1931 is a very rich it's the you know he becomes abstract in october 1930 begins making abstract works and then in 31 has an explosion of intensity and all different kinds of vocabularies coming out in 31 and in 32 he makes the first suspended mobile the one above us is actually being one of the very earliest suspended mobiles i guess another piece i could call out is 53 black dots it has this these threads, so the objects, the, the shapes, are suspended by threads. So they're wires uh, horizontally and threads vertically. And the shapes spin on the threads. The whole thing is very active. But the, the shapes disappear and then reappear. It's a whole sequence of appearance and disappearance um, that is tremendously gratifying. That sculpture is a later, larger version of a mobile he made in 1941, also black dots. He considered himself a human, like Guritz, who considered human qualities the key ingredient, um, not, not some sort of uh, insistence on, you know, um, a tradition or certain aspects coming from specific places. It was a world culture. He's talking about sculptors specifically and how sculptors throughout the ages have ended up with precious materials. And this is something he rejects. He doesn't want the finest marble. He doesn't want bronze. He doesn't want to have um, materiality in that sense be a key ingredient. He's happy to work with, you know, um, cast off materials, recycling materials. We have this sculpture over here, the tree from 1941, which is. Um, a stabile with a very slim, slender uh, top, a horizontal line at the top of the hole, and then there's a mobile hanging in suspension, which is a series of objects which are all recycled. Um, they're broken pieces of glass and some other objects. In the jewelry case, the last work of jewelry is a necklace, and it's um, it's a wonderful necklace. Basically, it's a, it's a Chinese 19th century export porcelain plate that has an image of a carp that's been hand painted in the glaze. And uh, there's a stack of these, even now in the Calder House in Connecticut. And during a lunch, one of them was broken by accident. And again, it says throwing it away. He picked up the pieces as they had broken, as, na as nature had caused the fractures. And he caged each of the major five fractures in silver wire and made this extraordinarily beautiful necklace. Um, and now the fish elements are completely abstracted. You don't see the fish anymore, but you see, full, you know, you see texture and form and a little bit of color. Um, I chased that necklace for 20 years to, to bring it back to be part of our collection because not just because it was a beautiful piece of jewelry, but because it shows his process and intention. And it really is a very, very good educational tool for us. Abraham Cruzillegas did a residency in my grandfather's studio a few years back, a wonderful residency, a great artist. And his he's a very original artist, but his relationship to Calder is very clear. Suspension objects and so on. The reutilization of materials. Um, it's been very gratifying in the last, let's say, 10 years of the recognition of Calder's inventions and his use of new ideas that are very contemporary. I mean, now in the 21st century, so many artists are working, not just making a mobile, I don't mean that. I mean, working in the um, time-based art, you know, not just kineticism, but also the passage of time, recogni recognition, of, um, recognition of some of these ideas has been really, really great with contemporary artists. And when he came in 68, he was especially uh, rewarded by um, this kind of um, richness, which we don't have. You know, we don't have it in the United States, that kind of richness. It's like there was a rejection of the decorative arts by, you know, aesthetic people. But my grandfather wasn't like that at all. He loved, um, you know, early art forms. He liked. Um, 
he had some Mexican things in his house. He also had some pre-Columbian things in his house, and he gave my, my grandmother pre-Columbian jewelry, um, some of which he acquired here, some of which he acquired in trades uh, for mobiles and things with dealers. Um, so in 68, when he came, really it was Matias Goritz who brought him here to, uh, for this commission for El Sorojo. And it was also kind of a, Matias took a, a very strong role, a leading role in the project. He made it much bigger than Calder thought it was gonna be. So for instance, the original model, um, which is in the exhibition, then they made a much larger intermediate model to explore the aspects of scale and also the technicalities of rigidity and things like that. And then from that, it was explo explored, you know, it's just expanded really, really large. My grandfather was happy about that, but it wasn't his idea to make it 84 feet tall. You know, it's the tallest sculpture that he ever executed. Um, and Matias was, was driving that. Really, really quite interesting. Wonderful collaboration between the two. And the fact that it was made here in Mexico, um, it's a completely unique sculpture. It wasn't made in France. His normal process was to make things in France, ship them on a boat, bolt them together in place. This sculpture is welded in place. It's a complete work, welded in place. Working with this institution was very seamless and incredibly fine. Uh, it was such a pleasure, really. Um, when Tatiana first came to make a presentation, I had intrepidation. I was a little bit worried that this, you know, this famous architect was going to come with arrogance and present an idea that was going to be difficult. And it was entirely the opposite. She was the most lovely person and presented a great idea. So the whole project has been like that. It's just very fluid and um, tremendously satisfying. <laughs>